Shall we start? So. Yeah, ready when you are. Uh, it's not quite started streaming yet. I'll tell you when it's live. Okay, well, we're live, so we can start. Okay. Welcome to the People's Hearing, which is about the Bishopsgate Goods Yard. We brought everyone together because we're all who live in this area and, uh, and beyond extremely worried about the plans for this site that are on the table. The boroughs have both um, objected, but the Mayor of London will decide on Thursday 2 p.m. at a hearing and we are worried that his planning officers signal their um, willingness to um, pass the scheme. We are re our campaign, campaign is called Reclaim the Goods Yard and we, were, we came together quite recently and we hope that we represent the many objections to the scheme and all the different objections there are. And we know that there is evidence to support our objections. So we thought we would ask people here to talk about some of that evidence and those supporting uh, opinions. Um, we are going to send a report of this meeting to the mayor. And if you'd like to ask a question, do so by the, twi the by Twitter, our goods yard, or the YouTube chat. Thank you very much to Owen Hathaly for chairing today. I will now pass to Owen. Thanks, Lucy. So, um, but, so before we sort of go to what we have, which is all sorts of things, really, we've got sort of various um, local residents, architects, economists, um, activists, films, all sorts of bits and bobs. But before we sort of go into it, because there's going to be quite a lot, um, I think it's sort of worth talking about the significance of this site in particular, because of the fact that it's sort of, in many ways, can be seen as a sort of test for local democracy and the degree to which um, boroughs and residents actually have any particular sway in the development process. Um, the kind of, the, 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 the sort of enormous scale sort of development on, on this site has been opposed by both of the local authorities involved. It's caused a great deal of hostility on the ground. And architecturally, it's of a, I think I can fairly say, of a very, very low quality indeed. Um, so it begs the question really of sort of like, how bad does something have to be before you can sort of stop it through the political process? And also how much can that sort of opposition on the ground be ignored? And I think one sort of adds to that without wanting it to be too, sound too contrived. Um, the question of whether or not, particularly in the current context, whether we need in any way the things that are being proposed for the site. You know, does, does this particular area need a 150, you know, room luxury hotel? Does it need, um, you know, 300 or so unaffordable flats? Um, and I think that's some of the sort of things that will be brought out in all of this over the next hour or so, um, I think. And some of the kind of, as well as the kind of just a simple question of opposition to something like this, there's also the question of whether or not we can actually propose anything better. You know, campaigns sort of frequently get criticised for the kind of like, yes, well, what would you do in its place? And thankfully, in this particular example, there's been various proposals over the last five years for things that could be, do, that could be done instead of this. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll touch, on, touch on that as well in the next hour. So the first thing we've got is a three minute film sort of showing a sort of visualisation of the scheme, um, which I can't switch on, but someone else can. Yeah, I'll have a go at
So <laughs> everyone's now seen this. Um, obviously, it isn't actually continuously read and with no windows, um, but people will, will, will be able to kind of get the idea. So for anyone sort of tuning into this who doesn't sort of know the area, it's sort of roughly the sort of exact point where, or almost the exact point where the city and the East End meet to the north. And in many ways, you can just sort of see it's this sort of gigantic expansion of the sort of city's economy into that area just by kind of ramming this sort of huge wedge of, um, you know, sort of luxury flats and sort of and hotels and various boondoggles onto this public and publicly owned site. Um, so the next thing we have. Um, I, I, which I th where I think that question of the fact that this is publicly owned and hence this is a somewhat different question than, 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 than something that's on developers' land. Um, we'll come in. So we've got residents who are going to give sketches of the scheme's problems and four particular themes. Um, we've, so I think, yeah, I think we should sort of go straight to them at this point, um, if everyone has the... Jonathan, 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 um, could I, Jonathan, could I, sorry, could I just ask Jonathan, um, can you, are you, sorry, I need to be able to communicate with Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, hi, hi. Are you, uh, can you get messages? Um, yeah. Or not? Yes. Okay. Sorry, sorry to, sorry to button. Okay, thanks. Right, over to you, Jonathan. Uh, right, I'm just going to show... Uh, You've got two sounds coming out. Um, there you go. That's a bit better. Um, I'm just going to put up a picture of the scheme um, so that we can see uh, the different uses involved there. Um, we've got offices uh, at the Shoreditch High Street end. Um, that purple bit is a hotel in the middle with uh, housing above it, luxury housing above it. Um, and then the kind of mixed use scheme moving towards the Brick Lane end. Um, now, Liz has asked me to talk about housing, but I'm just gonna quickly read our um, mission statement to give, you, to give you a idea of what we think is wrong with the scheme overall. And then I'll just touch on housing a bit more. 
Um, so our mission statement, um, for London to, th to thrive, we need to house L Londoners, keeping a diverse population at its centre at all levels of the economy. But over the last 20 years, the City of London has grown upwards and outwards, while East London residents and traders have been driven out by escalating rents and unaffordable homes. The Bishopsgate Goodyard is a public land owned by Network Rail. Covering 10 acres, it is the largest brownfield site in inner London, yet it has sat empty since the fire in 1964. We want it to be used for public good through an exemplary development that addresses the housing crisis as well as the needs of small businesses of the local community. The goods yard should serve the East End, not just add to the number of city offices and luxury flats. It offers a unique opportunity to deliver a world-class solution, just as the neighbouring Boundary Estate started a revolution in public housing a century ago. We demand public authorities rise to the challenge to create a visionary, lasting and environmentally responsible scheme for this site. Public land is increasingly rare, like an endangered habit, it needs protection. Let the people develop a new urban ecosystem here to revive the spirit of the East End. Um, and one of the um, motivators here is that the um, developers always talk about the context being the city, but we rather think the context is uh, the housing in Tower Hamlets and in particular, the Boundary Estate, which is just lies just to the north of it. Um, now, I've got this wonderful book, <laughs> which I like to carry around with me. If you, I don't know if you can, I don't, actually, I can't show it to you because my um, face thing, to, uh, face recognition but breaks up. It's called A Revolution in London Housing. Uh, it's published by the GLC in one of the final years of its existence. And it's about um, the Boundary Estate and the coming together of the London County Council. Uh, uh, and its architecture department and their first housing projects. Um, now the housing, uh, if you look at the scheme that we've got in front of us on that picture, it looks like there's lots of housing, but the problem is the kind of housing and the amount of housing we don't think is, is appropriate. Um, the developers like to tell us that 50% um, of this housing is affordable. That's not actually the case. Um, the actual number of housing units that are affordable um, in developer terms is actually 37%. Um, they're counting habitable rooms, not actual homes. Um, but even that 37%, which amounts to, so the total number of housing on, on offer here in total is between 385 to 500 homes. Um, of that, um, a maximum 185 are affordable in developers terms. However, uh, developers affordability is not actually affordable and 50% of that is actually what they would call low cost rent, um, which actually brings us down to between 60 and 90 low cost rent homes. Now, even within that low cost rent category, there are actually two rental tiers in there, one of which is called Tower Hamlets Living Rent. Um, now, Tower Hamlets Council themselves um, in one of their um, housing availability reports from a couple of years ago stated that uh, the people uh, who living town its living rents are designed to help cannot actually afford those living rents. So the only truly affordable housing are, are the truly low cost rent, uh, rent homes, which come to about 30 to 45 units in this whole scheme. Uh, now, recently, um, I live on the Dorset estate, which is um, close by. Uh, the council has managed to uh, eke out a new council house development project uh, on a small piece of car park on the Dorset estate, providing 20 to 25 truly low cost council homes. So on this fast development here, we've got an offer in terms of council housing, not much larger than something that's been eaten out of a small piece of car park on a, on a nearby estate. Uh, and we really don't think that's good enough and we want to see proper effort being made to provide properly social housing, properly managed and properly built. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, shall we ask Susanna to talk about the light problems? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Susanna and I represent, uh, well, I'm a Boundary resident. I'm really privileged to be living in a Boundary estate that uh, as what Jonathan said, it's the revolution in London housing. I have the same book incidentally since he can't show you. This is the book. Um, so I'm really privileged and this the ethos of this um, amazing great two listed estate. 
when it was built in 1890s was 100% for the poor, you know, and it remains today largely a social housing estate. Uh, it's built with a lot of thought. You know, we have a light. Every window is supposed to have a 45 degrees uh, angle to light. Lovely courtyards. And, and because of this development, Heritage, uh, all the Heritage Association has warned that our light will be affected. But I'm not here just to speak for the 2,000 residents here on the Boundary Estate. I'm here to speak for all the residents that will have their light affected by this development. And sadly, we, have, we had, as, as a resident ourselves, we had to dig into the detail in the thick uh, appendix uh, of the development uh, proposal to kind of retrieve all the lists of streets and homes that will be affected by this loss of light. And in, as we all know, with the loss of light and overshadowing uh, through many months, uh, through winter and the autumn, this will lead to ment effect on mental well-being and our physical well-being. I mean, you've seen all the vitamin D deficiency, etc. So I'm here to speak for everyone who has who will have to lose their light for no reason at all, really unnecessary. And I'm saying, why can't this piece of land be used for 100% social housing and not block the rest of the residents who are already living here and have respect for us and not rob us of our light and build in a way that could um, achieve another revolution in London housing for the 21st century. So um, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm speaking for everyone whose light will be blocked, whose shadows, who will see shadow overcast uh, beyond the boundary estate all the way to Hackney. And imagine those living on Brick Lane, imagine those living on Bethnal Green, Sclater Street, Wheeler Street, Commercial Road, it's, it's just, and for what? For, for, for that paltry few units that um, Jonathan mentioned just now for social housing. So that's, that's, that's my position. And I'm asking the mayor to not approve this uh, at the peril of everyone living here. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Now, can we ask Alec Forshaw to speak about the heritage? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Hey. Good, that's good. Hello, yeah, I'm Alec Forshaw. Um, I'm a trustee of the Spitalfields Trust, um, but by background, um, I'm a, a former conservation officer. I used to work for the London Borough of Islington, so um, quite a lot of experience in dealing with big schemes. Um, uh, understanding uh, this scheme, is, actually Jonathan sort of put his finger on it really, is what actually is the site? Is it an extension of the City of London, um, the ever-expanding City of London, or is it part of the East End, part of Spitalfields and Shoreditch? And that's really at the nub of the problem, um, where the developer um, is imagining it to be part of the city, whereas um, most of the objectors do not want that um, vision to take place. In terms of the uh, impact of this scheme. Um, it's a very widespread one um, and uh, I think a very serious, um, seriously harmful impact. A lot of um, legal debate often turns around the, the words substantial or less than substantial harm. Um, in my view, um, whatever that sliding scale is, um, the impact here, as you can see from these slides, is extremely serious. Um, and the cumulative impact, I think, is even more serious here. You're going to see particularly the tall buildings from all over the place. And in fact, the importance of cumulative or aggregate, um, aggregate um, harm has recently been uh, endorsed by the Secretary of State um, on his um, decision on the Norwich Anglia Square um, scheme. Now, um, the GLA have recently commissioned um, a, a heritage consultant called Nigel Barker um, to do a supposedly independent evaluation of the scheme. Um, and in my, my mind, um, he 
undervalues the, the amount of harm here almost as badly as the applicant's own heritage consultants. Um, for example, he, he says the impact on Shoreditch High Street and St Leonard's Church is modest. Well, I query his judgment, um, and indeed I've queried it before. Um, Nigel Barker was, for example, supportive of the office redevelopment scheme at Smithfield Market. He was supportive of the British land scheme um, at Norton Folgate. Um, and how independent actually is he? Um, I see in his introduction to his report that he's actually been involved with the development of this scheme for several years alongside the applicant. He also um, suggests that Historic England have no objection on heritage grounds, but um, I don't think that is the case. Um, even though perhaps they haven't objected as strongly as they might have, um, they do actually say, and I quote, proposals will have a dominant and harmful impact on the setting of many local conservation areas and listed buildings. Well, that sounds like an objection to me. Um, so uh, how the real worry, I think, here is that the GLA officers are, um, who have really no expertise or interest in heritage, um, how are they going to be swayed by the various serious objections that there are to this scheme? Um, and um, what can be done about it if the JLA are minded to approve it in the, in the teeth of opposition? Um, and I suppose, you know, we're going to have to look at trying to persuade the Secretary of State to call it in um, to, so that the proper inquiry is held, chaired by a planning inspector, um, if things go wrong. Um, and a crucial part, um, as I'm sure will be explored more this evening, is the issue of an alternative. Um, it was the existence of alternative ideas that saved Smithfield, um, and indeed that I think are going to save Norwich. So having an alternative, um, a better approach is absolutely critical, as well as criticising the proposals before us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. So now we're going to hear from some of the traders in Bethnal Green Road via a, a, a film. And then after that, we will go to Francis from New Economics Foundation. We can't hear, we can't hear. Sorry, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Hi, my name's uh, Kusei, and um, I'm a owner of Newman Station on Bethel Green Road. We've been here for the last 50 years, and um, our vision is to stay here for another 50 years. But we strongly feel that the development passed by the GLA won't allow us to stay here as an independent business. We feel that uh, the current plan for the Bishopsgate Goods Yard is, is very much um, catered for big organizations and big business and is just going to push us out of this area. I'm on Rebecca Sons and uh, I, my name is Mr. Ahmed. I've been here for, I lived in, I've actually lived in this area for about 15 years. And all the people that used to live here, I've actually moved out. Why do you think that is? Because of the uh, rent is too high and uh, it's, too, it's getting too expensive. It's, you know, like the council not providing anything, no help. Corporate business would come over and swamp all the small businesses over. And it won't be traditional local businesses again. It'll be like corporate businesses only in London, in this area. And it's to take a long, long time to build local businesses up. Small businesses like our business here. Hi, my name is Abdul. I'm the owner of Rose Locksmith and DIY. We've been here in Bethnal Green for about 15 years now. Um, already with what's going on in the world, our business has gone down quite, quite, quite a lot. 
um, we want to object to this development as we don't think it's right for this area. Um, it's a huge development that's going to last 14 years of construction and, you know, noise, pollution and parking issue. Uh, we don't believe that we're going to benefit as business from this sort of construction. It's going to make this area completely different. Local people ain't going to benefit the way they keep staying. There's been huge development already in this area, which we don't really see the benefit of extra footfall and new customers. It's only going to benefit the rich people to invest their money. They're just going to buy and leave it. It's going to attract chains. Chain ain't good for local trade traders. My name's Anna Serena, I'm part of the Pelici family. Pelicis have been here for over 120 years. Our family started 120 years ago. We're proud and happy to have been serving our local community for those many years. We object against the Bishopsgate Good Yard development for one major reason. We've always been part of the community. Bethnal Green really is a community. And I fear, we fear as a family, if it goes ahead, the community will be destroyed, heart will be destroyed. Already so much of the heart of the East End is, is being ripped out. This will be the final nail in the coffin. Hi, my name's Lila McAllister. This is my shop, Lila's shop at Grocers, and I have a cafe next door. Um, I've been here since 2002, that's 18 years. Um, I'm strongly opposed to this development on the Bishop's Goods Yard. I think it's going to have a devastating effect on the neighbourhood and on small businesses, um, which there's a lack of diversity in the scheme. This neighbourhood is famous for markets and workshop units and studio spaces. And these are the things that um, make it appealing to live and work here. Okay. Thank you. So can we hand over to Francis from Northrop from the New Economics Foundation. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Owen and everybody. Thank you uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, I, just a quick introduction. Um, Francis Northrop, as Lucy says, I work for the New Economics Foundation where I'm an associate fellow and my, my background and specialism is in local economies and high streets. Um, and currently I'm working with the East End Trades Guild, so Kasey from the uh, video just there and with the Guardians of the Arches and also with the campaign to save Lyme Village, which is a similar kind of uh, problem in a different part of London. I just kind of wanted to start off saying that we really have to situate this hearing and this, this development in the, in the moment that we find ourselves in. Like we're at the end of a year where all the gross inequities of the world have been completely exposed. We're facing climate and ecological crisis and there, like things have just changed so dramatically that it's like it's like a it's like a thing from a different era where it's like you're looking at sort of dinosaur kind of sort of development even you know without the, the obvious nature of the fact that it's just not very good architecturally and so there's so many positive things as well that are happening you know like architects and culture and councils declaring climate emergencies there's um hackney and other boroughs working on community wealth building and really it is that kind of that approach that we need the you know looking at the london recovery board and the different missions that they have there including things like um you know increased mental health and well-being strong communities young people good work green new deal all those things that are all wrapped up in one of the missions which is um around high streets and looking at what a 15 minute city should might look like something that we've all been experiencing over the last um, nine months with our local communities and, and small businesses creating that 15 minute city for us. And so, like I said, this, this development is from a different era. Like the, the amount of housing that is just flats with no outside space, you know, office blocks, chains with, um, you know, retail and restaurants. These are not the kind of things that were desirable before, but now they're, they, it just looks like some kind of cognitive dissonance really. And what's really concerning is that obviously the viability is, is not there. There's no viability environmentally, socially or economically, but also financially. So inevitably the developer will be arguing that case and rowing back on all the things, all the, all the uh, commitments they've made to affordability, 
within this development. So if it is granted, those things won't actually happen. But none of this is to say that that site shouldn't be regenerated, as people have talked about. There's so many different opportunities for that kind of, uh, for a new kind of development that kind of references the old, like the Boundary Estate or Coin Street or the development corporations that, um, you know, kind of sprung up around Milton Keynes and the Letchworth Garden City approaches. And increasingly, there are people looking at different ways of bringing forward public land. I, mean, I mentioned Latin Village and the community plan for Ward's Corner there. That's a real opportunity with TFL owned land. Um, there's, TFL themselves are working, you know, really proactively with their tenants and residents across London to make sure that they've got security of tenure, that, you know, they, they have affordability and also that the, the value that they bring is, um, is reflected um, in, in their approach to them. And this is in stark contrast to all the other landlords in the city and developers who are not valuing that kind of thing. And so if we start to look at that as an approach, if we start to use, if, if local authorities use that as a, a kind of a, a standpoint now where they say, right, OK, going into 2021, the difference that we need now is that we stand with people in a public kind of commons partnership we don't we don't work with the private anymore we don't prioritize them they are stakeholders but they're secondary stakeholders what we want to do is work with our communities with our local businesses and the, the places that make the east end and areas of london so vibrant so that then what you might be looking at is something in 2021 where cities are, are leading the change for a, a completely different approach to development um, which is at the moment being championed by Liverpool with their land commission and their, their mayor there. It really feels like there's an opportunity now for London to be really at the forefront of that recovery and that message that actually our, our cities are not for extractive profit anymore. They are for the people who live there and who deserve those good quality spaces. Thanks, Francis. Um... Yeah, I think there's, there's lots there. I think what we've got next is uh, Richard Brown from the uh, Centre for London, who's going to talk about imagine similar themes about a sort of post-COVID manifesto. So if you could yeah. make yourself known. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. And um, thank you for inviting me along uh, this afternoon. Uh, really good to be involved in this discussion. I, I'll say a word about our um, recovery manifesto in a moment. I mean, I suppose a bit like this scheme, it's something that comes from a slightly different period. Um, and it's a period of great, um, yeah, even though we were writing it as a period of great uncertainty. But just before I say a few things about that, I mean, I think <coughs> the interesting, and this site has a very long history, which I know people will talk about later. Um, this, this difficult transition between what's part of the city of London, what's part of the communities around it has been, um, you know, a, bone of contention on, on Norton Folgate, on the Spitalfield schemes. And it's still, it's, it feels like it's a it's a it's um, it's an issue that's never been quite resolved. You know, what does the nature of that transition look like? Um, and it's, you know, been debates over the past 30 or 40 years, during which time this part of London has undergone a dramatic change itself. Um, you know, in a way, left over from the early 90s recession. Uh, the resurgence of Spitalfields, the, I suppose, reinvention of Hoxton and places like that as creative quarters was something that came out of a previous property recession, came out of a previous crash <coughs> when uh, a surplus of commercial space became available on the edge of the City of London. So I, I think there's a long history here and it would be interesting to think about what might have been learned from some of those other schemes in terms of trying to make that uh, transition. What we tried to do in our recovery manifesto is take a snapshot and give some early thoughts about um, some of the ways London needs to change. But we did that in a circumstance of huge uncertainty. I mean, we know there's a huge blow to London's economy, particularly central London's economy, particularly the lower paid workers in central London who actually rely on face-to-face uh, -face interaction with tourists and with commuters. Um, <clears throat> we know there's actually, we're seeing more recently, there's been a hit to London's internationalism as workers from overseas have uh, gone home um, and that's going to be a significant change I think in London's workforce. Um, we can see a hit to the property market um, and uh, many people would uh, see that was a healthy uh, thing in many ways uh, if rents could be brought down both residential and commercial. And we're also seeing a change in working patterns and we don't really know where that's going to end up the extent to which people will return to commuting will live a more hybrid working life 
or what that means for centres like London. And I think that's the big challenge here is we don't quite know what the future nature of the central activity zone of central London is. Will we see a sort of rebirth of the central activity zone as before? You know, the, the planning led consolidation of commercial activities within uh, the central London area and the north of the Isle of Dogs, Canary Wharf, for want of a better word. Will we see a more spread perhaps and more mixed uh, activity zone, which actually has more residential in it, more like central Paris, for example, which had very different uh, fate through the uh, crisis from London, uh, with that greater mix of living and working. And we're already seeing that happening in central London. There are already more people moving back into central London um, alongside the communities who've stayed there and have, have, have often felt um, marginalised in central London. Or do we see a shift to a more polycentric form of city growth um, with sub subsidiary centres across the city taking a bigger role? I suspect that central London will, um, in some form, continue to be a focal point uh, for London's economy. Um, I think there is an opportunity now to actually create space for um, new uses, for startups, some of the things that will bring back diversity into central London. And we've talked in our manifesto about whether you could look at enterprise zone type approaches to actually enable um, new businesses to move in uh, where perhaps standardised commercial office space was looking redundant. Um, we need to look again at property taxes. Um, which fall very heavily on small businesses and fall very lightly on uh, wealthy residential property owners. Um, and we need to look at support for the visitor economy. And one of the things that surprised me uh, to a degree is the extent to which central London's uh, retail and hospitality industries are much more dependent on uh, visitors to central London than they are on commuters. Commuters are only a small part of that business. And actually thinking what will the tourists, domestic and international, be looking for as we come out of this crisis through 2021 and 2022, what will the mix of uses they want to see be that actually brings them in and shows off the culture that London has, I think will be really important. So, and those are some of the observations from our uh, manifesto. I mean, alongside, there's gonna be a lot that needs to be done about unemployment because particularly some of the uh, more vulnerable people in London will be pushed down uh, the, the employment chain, um, but and also about micromobility. But I think those perhaps are some of the big ones. It's thinking what's the future nature of central and what part can a place like Bishopsgate Goods Yard play in it? Thank you. Um, yeah, excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, so what we have next is uh, Julie Futcher, who's a researcher in climate response and urbanism, who will be talking about the kind of health impact of, of the scheme on this, on this scale. So Julie, if you're here somewhere. Is she here? Does everyone know? Does anyone know? Lucy, you're muted. She's here, but she's on mute. We can't hear you. I'm a bit, I'm a bit, uh, I haven't quite got used to this ah, great. Zoom stuff. I really don't like looking at myself in the, in the camera. I find it very uh, disconcerting. Everybody spoke very this. well, <laughs> and I really enjoyed um, listening to what everybody had to say, but I'm not going to talk particularly about health and well-being, I'm going to try and give you a very dense overview. So um, I'm going to be reading from a script, which I don't normally do. So sorry about that, but I don't have the prompts of the, um, the slides to uh, help you. So my name is Julie Futcher. I am an, I'm a chartered architect and a built environment consultant. And my work is concerned with climate responsive urbanism. That is, how do we take our, uh, our current um, existing environments through the future. My focus is on the influence of built form. Um, that's uh, the influence of building and urban form. That's the form of buildings and the spaces in between buildings and how they modify the climates of neighboring buildings and the outdoors. So I'm really concerned with the dynamic and interdependent influence of built form, particularly tall buildings on the urban setting and how these can be optimized to promote healthy environments that encourage more sustainable urban practice. So uh, this works, this research is being carried out um, through a number of projects that focus in and around the city of London and includes both field measurements and simulated data. Um, I started this work with some colleagues. I have, a, I'm, a, I'm an architect, as I said, but I have a, a team of um, uh, climate scientists and um, architects and engineers uh, who I work with on, on this. And we've been researching um, the city of London since around 2000, 
around 2013. And our research draws attention to many of the interdependent built form outcomes, which currently fall outside the broader discussion on sustainable urban development, including those on health and wellbeing, green infrastructure and air quality. We don't really have time to go into this in detail, but a lot of this work has been published and includes studies around the Heron Tower, 20 Fenchurch Street, and the original Bishop Gateford's Yard and proposal back in 2015. What these studies showed us was that there is a growing importance of built form in increasingly urban, dense urban environments, which leads us to ask this very simple question. Where does the energy boundary of the building end? Our research has shown us that it can no longer be considered to lie at the building envelope, but to extend into the wider environment. What is it that we mean by that? Well, currently, building energy management is considered the standalone building. That is how it performs by itself. It doesn't really look at the wider implications of that. For example, overshadowing, changes to the wind fields, and, and all of that kind of all of those kind of things. Our research shows us that um, these effects are dynamic and far reaching, but they are both positive and negative. That is, they can have both a good effect and a bad effect on the wider environment. So not only do we need to think about mitigating and adaption, but we also need to think about optimization. And what this is where built form really comes into play. What's also important to know is that in the UK, microclimate evaluation, which is what this phenomenon is referred under the urban microclimate, is a planning consideration for larger buildings, not for smaller buildings, but for larger buildings such as this. But what's not considered is the wider impact of this. So we'll be looking at how overshadowing influences what's going on at street level, but it won't necessarily look at what that's what the impact of that on somebody's heating and cooling loads. So what we found is that the, the needs of these larger buildings are off, often trump those of the low-lying neighbours, which is what's happened, what we found with the Bishop's Gate for Jad proposal, the original one. That it impacts on the access to natural resources such as sun, daylight and wind. And what is often the case is that one green strategy, i.e. the energy of the energy efficiency will counter-react another, such as on-site harvesting, uh, on-site renewable energy harvesting and so on, through both passive and active systems, such as, for example, shading a photovoltaic array, such as 20, such as the Heron Tower, or stopping solar energy going through somebody's window, helping with their heating loads in the winter, which is very important when you have communities in um, fuel poverty. We don't account for those effects. The consequences of these actions typically result in a net energy penalty, but there is currently no requirement or framework for the systematic, systematic evaluation of cities of a city's emerging morphology on the wider environment to be evaluated. Instead, each building is evaluated on its own standalone merits, often achieving impressive sustainable credentials while neglecting their dynamic effect on the neighboring buildings. And this is something that we really have to change if we move, if we move forward, if we really want to achieve a low energy uh, future. Understanding the outcomes at a range of scale are of interest for cities where increasing urban density, particularly in terms of increased building height, is changing the urban landscape in such a way that the emerging urban morphology will have significant long-term impact on the existing outdoor climate and the ambient environment of other buildings. Yet these remarkable, uh, remarkable changes are proceeding without any overall guidance or assessment of the aggregate effect. By obstructing a neighbor's access to passive resources, we are obstructing its low energy potential. This standalone approach has left a legacy of buildings that not only have limited potential for mitigating and adaption strategies in the context of the urban setting, but also leaves a legacy of buildings that both sit within and forms the existing urban setting, which in turn further exasperates the possibility of low energy climate response of urbanism. Julie, I think we have to stop you. I think we have to stop you. 
Okay, well, let me just finish. We need to better understand what the long-term implications of increased urban density is as we move towards a low energy and warmer future. And we need to be mindful, it's not just about buildings, it's also about, also about the importance of open space and the provision of clean, comfortable air for all urban citizens. Okay, thank you very Thanks, much. Julie. Thanks for this. Um, Thanks a lot. Okay, so next we have uh, David Knight, who um, who currently describes himself as an urban strategist. So, um, David. Can, I, can I just intervene? Um, I'm a bit worried about Alec leaving at, sorry, Eric leaving at um, seven. So may I suggest that Eric comes in before Philip? Would that be all right, Philip? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Sorry. Just doing the time. David? Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I will endeavour to be to be brief. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to describe myself instead as a designer and author, I think, and I have a um, uh, PhD uh, hard one in the kind of politics of planning knowledge, which I guess is what I'd like to talk about tonight. Um, the point I'd like to make tonight, really, um, is that there should be more events like this. They should be earlier in the process. They need more power in the development process and they must maximize what communities on the ground can gain and contribute. I'd like to try and learn some lessons from the story of the goods yard that can help us the next time a large piece of London is replanned. Enormous energy has gone into this place most consistently from the communities around it, a lot of whom are here tonight. And I'd like to imagine how planning processes might change to better serve and benefit from that energy. If London continues to develop sites along similar lines to the goods yard, it's urgent that we explore ways of speaking in public about the future of these places from day one in a way that has real impact. We need to be demanding that these conversations have a real statutory impact on proposals and can therefore become propositional rather than forced into opposition. The goods yard closed in the late 60s and the current scheme, if it's approved, won't be finished until 2032. So it will have been a contested and often totally private site in the heart of our city for a minimum of 68 years, many of which have been characterized by deadlock and antagonism. Soon after it closed, participation became law in the UK so that communities have to be engaged in the development process. But before that, participation was very much the practice in places like Spitalfields, where tenants associations, activist groups, cooperatives and so on, all played direct active roles in making and maintaining the city. This time period has also seen extraordinary local activity. How many children have been educated in nature and how many tons of food have been grown at City Farm in Spitalfields since it opened in the late 70s? <clears throat> how many buildings and environments have been preserved and enhanced for future generations by organisations like the Spitalfields Small Business Association? How many homes built and refurbished by local housing associations, especially ones with strong roots in our Bangladeshi communities? And what have we learned in that time? We've learned that planning gets better when it works with people earlier and it gets better when an informed engaged public are protagonists. Public voices are not impediment to development or a statutory tick in a the box, they're fundamental to making a place worth building. We know that public engagement at the plan making stage is often low and unrepresentative and that most people's built environment activism, if it does start, starts when a planning application is lodged or when the big principles are already set in stone. Our national government is trying to speed up the making of local plans without saying much about how representative or egalitarian they are. This is in a context where 89% of British young adults have never been asked about the future of their neighbourhood. We've also learned in counterpoint that the public on occasion are a sophisticated player of the planning system, usually working late nights and with no budget and reliant when it's available on pro bono professional support. Tonight is the result of this kind of activism. Without a budget and often in extremely challenging circumstances, the public can be incredibly agile and focused in these contexts. Imagine if the creativity and creative effort that we see in counter development proposals could be focused from day one on benefiting the place. In documenting its present, imagining its future and informing organisations that can build as well as speak. That's me done. Thanks, David. That's, that, 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 that's uh, short and sweet. Um, so I think we, we now go straight into the, ne the next thing, which is about the Goodyard, Goodyard site itself and its history and some of the things that have, that, that have happened there and its prospects. And I think we have another, another film, uh, which I think we go to now.
The Bishopsgate Goods Yard was a railway terminal built in 1840. It was destroyed by fire in 1964. Some of the viaduct remains after the Braithwaite arches were saved thanks to English heritage and Prince Charles. The East London Line is built across the site and Shoreditch Overground Station. Some of the outside walls are still here and at the front the aureole is in a box waiting to be restored. On the top of the viaduct is a wild green space with no humans around. The goods yard is a ten and a half acre site in the boroughs of Hackney and Tower Hamlets, surrounded by five conservation areas, including the Boundary Estate, England's first council estate, and is very close to the City of London. In 1996, the Corporation of London invented the City Fringe so they could build offices outside the city boundary by giving funds to the hard-up boroughs next door. Their first conquest was Spitalfields Market, owned by Hampson and run by Ballymore, and they wanted more. Steered by the City of London, a good yard master plan was drawn up with help from Mayor Ken Livingston. Then Rail Track, the owners of the site, collapsed. And in 2002, in the rail track sell-off, Hammerson got hold of the goods yard, paying £63 million for 24 properties. Moving north from Spitalfields, the goods yard would be Hammerson's prize. Broadgate Tower was built at the edge of the city. More towers were planned west of the site, and in the end, some were built. In 2014, Hammerson and Ballymore put in a planning application for seven residential towers and a giant office building. Community petitions gathered 11,000 names, including a petition by Jules Pipe, mayor of Hackney, who was totally against the scheme. The developers asked Mayor Boris Johnson to take away decision-making powers from the two boroughs, thinking that Boris would surely wave through their plans. But in 2016, Boris Johnson's planning officers said they could not give approval. The developers withdrew, and then Sadiq Khan became mayor. Everyone thought the planning application would be killed off by the new mayor, but it has stayed at City Hall, with Jules Pipe now head of planning. Beginning in the 1980s, when consulted, the local community has given its views, and the community has always said, we are not part of the city. We are not a city fringe. The East End is a different place with a different history and different needs. Excellent. Um, so next we have um, Eric Reynolds, who, would, who was formerly the developer of uh, one of the site's temporary uses in his capacity at Container City. So um, he has to come in. So, um, Eric. Hello, everybody. Um, it's not entirely right to say Hammerson is still there, by the way, uh, in Spitalfields. The terrible tension between what we all would like to see, which is something that relates to local needs and encourages local business and decent housing and so on, is the intention, of course, with the terrible drive that the developer has to maximise everything, to make everything as large as possible, because as we know, 20% of their cost, sorry, an addition to 20% of their costs so they will make a profit whatever happens and that's the problem that's exactly why we have overdevelopment and so on my approach uh, when i started at spitalfields when i started much earlier than that in camden lock was lighter quicker cheaper get on with it other speakers have mentioned that this scheme is no longer really relevant to today because it was invented a long time ago and they've simply continued with it the larger the scheme the more likely it is that it will be no longer in time and really be relevant to current need. To get on with is what we tried to do. When we took a 10-year lease in Bishopsgate Goods Yard, it appeared that Crossrail would be a long way away, still is, of course, the East London line would be a long way away, and in fact, that moved forward. We took the yard for 10 years from rail track, with, with a lease which gave them the right to give a six months notice. But within our immediate getting on with it, we created a swimming pool, which some of you will remember. We created a very large corporate entertainment area and so on. And we made about a 
pounds in rent for rent. Stayed at that, that could have been about 100 and then divided by, say, seven or something. That would have put a value on the site, which would have made sense because the site had been empty. When I took it, <clears throat> the site had already been empty for over 35 years. A uh, very happy place for pigeons and so on, but no other use. And a very important connection between Brick Lane and Spitalfields and the city and so on was closed off. We opened it, it's called London Road, and, and, and we opened it. As Alex said, unless this group and other groups come up with a really sensible and doable alternative, the big scheme will remain the big scheme, and the big scheme will continue to pay significant sums of money in other forms of taxation, SIL and so on, and will always be preferred by the landowner, and in this case, by the commercial organizations are going to develop. So my proposal is that we would focus properly on an alternative that could be delivered, that could be made to work in a sustainable way. When we initially opened in Spitalfields, some of you remember, we started with a market. We there again built a community swimming pool. We built um, amazingly, and unfortunately it was torn down by our developer partner, but we actually built an op house. Now all those things are possible as long as we can be believable and get on with it. The interim uses that we put in to the goods yard and in the Spitalfields and the Camden and many others uh, were simply because at that time it was a poor that they couldn't continue their development. We have that situation again now. It's entirely possible that even where they get permission, they would go very slowly. So there may be a crack into which we can put a wedge, and as long as we can find a believable hammer to push that wedge in, we might be able to come up with an alternative scheme that actually works. We will, of course, be in trouble because they won't want it to be too successful because that will create a, dist a further distance between their plan and its actual uh, development is actual build. So uh, I've got to keep this short because you've all got so much else to say. If we don't come up with something that doesn't simply look like community whinging, but community activity that is worthwhile and economically sensible, then there is perhaps an opportunity. We need to really look at their numbers and try and find where the risk area is and see if there's a lump that we can de-risk for them by taking it on and getting on with it. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, Lucy, I know you wanted to kind of uh, come back to some of those figures, um, but I'm not sure which ones you meant in particular. So could you unmute and ask Eric on that? Sorry, Eric, you said you made, um, a, 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 was it, how much did you make for them per year? We didn't make, that's how much rent we paid. Because we had a highly successful, um, uh, we, we had a whole sort of layer cake of activities with, with a market on the bottom, with uh, gymnasiums, with swimming pool, with um, a very large 25,000 square feet of uh, corporate entertainment, which was very lucrative indeed. An awful lot of large, uh, city solicitors and so on had their summer parties, their Christmas parties. Hundreds of people coming in and, and drinking expensive alcohol. And uh, so much so that those of you who will remember the tents on the roof, we had to double the space by taking a part of the ten and a half acres to have tented space above the arches in order to take in people like Freshfields and so on, who have these enormous, I know now much less so, but at the time, enormous parties where people were prepared £100,000 on a party. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, so um, now, next, next person is going to speak. We've got only two more speakers and then we'll have a discussion. Um, so we've got Philip Rhodes, who is the Executive Director of the LSE Cities Programme, 
is going to talk a bit about the history of the goods yard and alternatives for the site. So, where are you? Thank, thank you, uh, Owen. Uh, um, unfortunately, I will not be the person who can really talk about the history, but I hope I can enlighten you with, you know, just some general thoughts. And the one when I spoke to Lee, Lucy that was quite helpful was if I had on the one hand a moment with the developers and a moment with the mayor, uh, maybe half a minute or a minute, what would I stress uh, to say, look, this is so, such an important decision. How can you ensure that you're reaching a better decision than the ones that may, the one that may be taken um, in a few days time? Uh, b before I get to these two um, points or scenarios, uh, I, I also wanted to emphasize that um, this is, of course, a huge site in London, but it has also raised a lot of international interest. Uh, and, and that just re-emphasizes that uh, there is something incredibly special. And when I first met and discussed this whole thing with Jonathan about a year ago, uh, I mentioned to him a book that was prepared uh, through a partnership between the London-based architect David Chipperfield and a Swiss architect called Simon Kretz. And they worked uh, on a book which was ultimately, and you can find it online, it's called On Planning a Thought Experiment, that just reminds everyone who is frustrated about the site that this raises much more fundamental questions than just, you know, how tall is the building, where's the overshadowing and so on. And that uh, there is something uh, deeply frustrating about how uh, planning is done, it's unsatisfactory, uh, and maybe also how the market uh, forces are working on this site. And there's this question about, um, are we getting uh, uh, the right things for a good social outcome? Uh, and I sometimes even wonder whether even developers would agree that, you know, we, we're running, this is a model which is uh, running out of steam and we need something very, very uh, new. And that brings you then back to the site. So there have been people, uh, and already a few of you have mentioned this as well. This is more than a site. Uh, is this a, a site for a new process? Is this even a site for sort of a new urban economy and thinking about it? But let's go back to the scenario of, you know, a minute with the developer. And a lot of this was said already, but I don't think it's fully understood. We have such great uncertainty. It's an overused term, but you know, we, we have now evidence, and this is not just London, this is not just the UK, this is a worldwide thing about the future of the urban economy, uh, and in particular, the future of urban knowledge work. And this scheme is more or less entirely designed around the current uh, up and tw until 2019, thinking around how knowledge work operates in cities with its offices, with its business travel assumption, and then a bit of conventional retail and also some assumptions on urban living. And I, I do think uh, one needs to be incredibly careful that we're just uh, using the past and extrapolate into a future which may look quite uh, differently. Um, we may already be seeing very soon new paradigms about the use of very scarce, centrally located, and of course, hyper accessible sites like the one we are talking about. Uh, and maybe sort of a, a claim like this needs to be more uh, shortage than the city is something that has already said many times, maybe also uh, a new and innovative mix of Brick Lane meets Barbican. Uh, but we don't know, and I wanna come back to this. Um, of course, the developer will uh, immediately say, look, it's good for me to get immediately planning permission. I can then still do a lot of things, but I wanna have the green light uh, in the box. But I think the pressures these guys then get on going ahead and maybe regretting is considerable. Now, the person that may be listening more to what I would have to say is maybe the mayor, I hope, and he will uh, hardly deny that we are uh, in a triple crisis. Of course, there is COVID, but there is a social justice crisis and there's a climate emergency, which was declared quite formally by, uh, this, uh, by, by the mayor uh, himself. And uh, what we are entirely ignoring with developments of the site is not just the climate impact in terms of operating the site, but constructing it. And that brings me to this beautiful term of carbon offsetting, uh, which of course is always used if you can't avoid the emissions through your processes and you just plant trees or subsidize uh, solar plants uh, somewhere else. Um, this is not what London should do. London needs to lead the way on sustainable construction, on ideally zero carbon construction, and we are not there yet. We need probably five to 10 years 
uh, before we can really start at scale uh, low carbon construction. If you give an okay at this point to the site, it's the good old concrete and steel and glass. Uh, and I think everyone needs to understand this. Offsetting is just not good enough. The mayor will turn around and say, look, my, my pressures on the economy and jobs is so immense. I just don't see uh, an alternative. And again, I would then push and say, you know, create these jobs in the construction industry of retrofitting, but not a new build using an outdated model. So in sum, and again, many people have said this, the big question London is facing, the developer is facing, whether is this uh, the last development of a past decade of London growth, or is this among the first developments of a new era of London sustainability? It's a very clear choice. Now, if it's the latter, and this is probably where I disagree a bit uh, with Eric, I think we need more time. I don't think, even if we set together, and the reality is none of us has a great, great idea because otherwise that, it would, that would have been taken off already. We don't have it. We need more time. It's difficult to come up with answers. A lot of innovation is required across the board. Uh, and therefore, as, as maybe uh, sort of defeatist as it may sound, the expansion of interim use, in my mind, is maybe the most sustainable thing one can do at this great moment of uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, okay, so now the last speaker we have for guest discussion is the architect Adam Khan. So if you... Hello, hi. No, there's so much, uh, really, thank you so much, really been excellent said. It's such a, it's clearly such a kind of emblematic project. And I, I just want to talk about the kind of need for, I think the, the missing p piece in all this is the idea of a brief or a kind of vision. And because I think what we're seeing, I think has clearly been not successful for any parties, I mean, including the developer. Um, it's a process of a laissez-faire planning system in which developers are incentivized to just come in, shoot for the moon, stack it up high and wait for the scheme to be knocked down, you know, chipped away. And it also a system in which forces local groups, local concerned parties to, to into a position of opposition. And, you know, that that kind of war of attrition just doesn't doesn't produce good good results. It also takes a really long time. So, you know, hence the delay, which means that when something does come in, it's like now, it's just incredibly out of date. So it's not adapting to today's needs because it's, you know, just drafted six years ago. So, um, and I think it's a doubly a shame really, because in that period, not only have we had new urgent, you know, uh, requirements, um, including, you know, ever more recent COVID, um, but actually we've grown in our capacity and skills. So we know we can actually do a large scale neighborhood planning as a collective endeavor, um, you know, in through co-production, through large scale um, visioning exercise. We've, you know, there's good examples of that and it can be done. And there's a kind of will to support that in, you know, in the mayor's office, you know, there's, there's that idea has a lot of traction mm -hmm. and there's a lot of uh, people uh, capable out there of, of doing it. So it would be an absolute opportune moment to, to reset and actually make that kind of brief, you know, uh, gather that brief because at the moment, you know, the planning is hands off. So, you know, um, who is stating the kind of vision for what this piece of city should be, you know, both morphologically and, in, uh, you know, in terms of urban design, but also socially, you know, who's it for? Um, that's the piece of work that needs to be generated before any designs get done. Um, and that, that needs to be a, have a consensus around it, about what, what anyone is actually aiming for in this piece of the city. Um, uh, but those, those can be done, I mean, those can be generated, and that will take time. So, um, but I th and I think uh, another issue is that the planning system, you know, as it is, is maybe set up for individual sites. But here we're talking about a whole not just neighborhood quarter, but it's a whole stitching in to different neighborhood quarters. It's, I mean, a real significant, huge piece of the city. So that kind of the process that might deal with one application and whether you like the color of it or not, is, is just not, um, not, not up to that kind of scale. I think there is another issue of scale in, that impedes development. I think as, you know, Eric was saying, um, you know, other cities break um, schemes down into smaller size plots. Traditionally, that has happened anyway, which allows a more kind of um, 
or organic testing of kind of smaller plots and uh, you know development plots. So there's no um, reason why the schemes couldn't be can be broken up into smaller plots, but with with a really strong overall vision that has been authored by um, by all stakeholders. And I think ultimately that does lead to value on all sides, not only for the community, but for actually for the developer. I mean, it just can't have been very good for the developer. You know, um, you know, what we need is for developers to actually do their job of being developers. That's what they're good at. That's what they want to do, not be kind of high stakes gamblers. Um, so we, we actually need developers to come with their capacity, their resources and mobilization abilities and actually build stuff. I, I do think we need um, developers, but this isn't, um, this is a complete distraction. This is this is a lot high scale gambling. So, um, yeah, a perfect moment for a reset, and we do have the capacity and tools to to build a consensus vision for that. But what would uh, what would emerge out of that is a brief um, that can then be um, given to developers and architects. Thank you. Um, that's excellent. Um, so we have a so it's been mentioned a couple of times the the um, proposals for the slide that were, that were kind of done, I think entirely sort of um, pro bono, just because of them being an interesting example, um, by David Chipperfield. And we have a, um, a letter from um, Chipperfield, which we got uh, a few hours ago, I believe, um, which I think is worth reading out, because I think that one of the really interesting things about this is that this is a, gi a gigantic site of enormous complexity. You know, you, you, you a, sort of a huge chunk of city partly on top of a railway line as a sort of air rights scheme involving, you know, housing and retail and offices and a hotel. And for it to kind of look a sort of, have be so sort of careless within something like that, something that's of, of such a sort of ambitious scale in terms of planning is really quite um, depressing. So, um, so I'm not going to put words into anyone's mouth here. So the letter is roughly as follows. I think I'll kind of read out most of it because it's all interesting. Um, so, so here goes. Um, the painfully drawn out decision-making around the site and its conflict-ridden development were the very reason Simon Kretz and I selected to be a case study back in 2017. It very starkly re revealed several critical issues within the planning process and its resources. Um, it is painful to see, and I cannot imagine for those living around it, that the three years after that work, the situation remains unchanged, and that the voice of the local community have little option but to resort to a form of protest, rather than being more fully integrated into the earliest process to determine the future of the site. Our study of the Bishopsgate Goods Yard was a theoretical project that raised questions about the value of commercial development, the power of planning departments, the ambitions of architects, and the representation of public interests. Based on personal experience, I know that the dominant narratives around such large-scale urban development tend towards caricatures of the various parties rather than analysis of the processes that mediate their interests. The alternative design proposals developed by students and staff of the Institute of Urban Design, ETH in Zurich, clearly demonstrate how much more complex issues could be better dealt with on site if they were included as part of the planning context and prove that one can simultaneously address the commercial and logistic concerns of the investors, as well as engage wider urban and social concerns. Crucially, those two areas of concern, commercial viability and social cultural concerns, were not mutually exclusive. Planning is critical in holding things in balance, not just as a facilitation process. It cannot deal with the problems that are raised by urgency, investment and logistics alone, must give presence to those issues that have no other representation. If we believe in the future of our cities, we must protect and foster the qualities for which we value them. We must invest in our planning departments and as citizens and system working with them further upstream. We must urgently open up the conversation about the role of planning and urban developments, encouraging an approach that takes account of the complexities and collective interests that form a city long before a design is developed. Um, while I'm unable to join you, I very much admire ambitions of the people's hearing and hope that the views and ideas collected through your campaign will be considered by the Mayor of London. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of lots there very, very much about the kind of role of, of planning and all of this that I think we can probably talk about a bit as we, as, as we go to a discussion. Um, so I'm going to kind of throw a few things out there, first of all, take, sort of abusing the, the privilege of the chair. Um, one of which is about the ownership of the site, one of which is about need and questions of need, and the other of which I think is going back to this idea of a, of a reset. So on the first of those, one of the things that strikes me, and I may not be completely right on this, 
is the degree to which the site is at least partly in public ownership. So that network rail uh, you know, have, have a very important role on this particular site. And also the role of the, of the Mayor of London's sort of ability to call things in and why this is sort of, there's a sort of negative rather than the positive. There's kind of like, we can stop a thing, but we're not necessarily sure if we as the public authority will be able to do it ourselves. Which given that the GLA's precursor, the Great London Council used to do this routinely, um, seems questionable in my view. Um, but there's also this kind of thing of like, you know, that there are, there are these two councils, there's the mayor and there's network rail. And why these public bodies can't develop a public site for the public good, for the people that live in that area that, that have various needs that are not that would not be met, would clearly not be met by the current proposal, seems to me an interesting thing to talk about. One of them, and the other thing is obviously this question of need. Um, the, the ship appeal proposal is very much going to bring this out, that there are various things that, that the site could offer for the local community, which is currently almost sort of ostentatiously ignored within this site. It's based on this idea that this is an expansion of the city rather than something that could potentially provide things for the community there, of which obvious examples would be council housing, um, a park in an area that really is, 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 is lacking in green space and currently a lot of it is quite wild. Um, and obviously the things people have already brought up, brought up in terms of, 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 of commercial uses that would be less um, corporate. Um, and then this, this question of like what, what use a site like this would, would be in the current context. Um, one of those is the context, is a context of planning and of housing. Like the, the mayor's own um, investigations recently on, on, on affordable housing, on um, resident consultation, and although that's not, that's not directly connected to this on the state regeneration, has shown that the kind of model that the GLA has worked on for the last 20 years of a sort of, of, a sort of gigantic trickle-down model um, has not worked. It has not delivered a significant amount of affordable housing. It's not delivered council housing. And it's not delivered particular kind of community or economic benefit for existing residents. So we know that now. We have the research. We know for a fact this stuff does not work. Um, and then obviously there's the question of, of, of COVID, that if we were to imagine this, this building had been built 10 years ago, let's say, it would have been a black hole for the last nine months. Very little of it would have been in useful, in, in, in a, uh, served any useful kind of purpose for that community. The, the hotel would have been empty, much of the commercial housing would probably be vacated. Um, and there's not, you know, obviously the retail units being corporate would be full of kind of functions that are currently going out of business as uh, sort of lots of large chain retail is, and, 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 uh, and, and, and chain restaurants are currently going out of business en masse. Um, so we can kind of see almost a kind of within that a kind of preview of what this thing might be like in 20 years of just this kind of gigantic kind of useless hulk in the, in, 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 in the center of this area. So, um, so those are the kind of the, the pointers that I'd like to kind of bring out. Um, but there's other ones that we have we have kind of um, already kind of pre-suggested, such as what would make a better development, and how can we achieve something that better now? Um, and I think those are also kind of worth worth talking about. So um, anyone that kind of wants to ask questions um, in the audience um, should be able to, I think, uh, via YouTube. Um, but people that are already in the call, um, please you know, um, please come in and have a big argument. I think we've got a raised hand by Michael Edwards. This does not surprise me. Can I speak for a moment? Yes, please. Well, a lot of very wonderful presentations and contributions have been made and it seems to me things are going very well here and I hope that uh, somehow this can be conveyed to the Mayor of London. I want to add one thing to this discussion, which is the view that I think it's very widely felt around the country that the future has got to be different from the past. That we've learned through the COVID pandemic episode that really the nature of our society has got to change in all sorts of ways. In the way we live, the way we work, 
the experiences we have if we're in the bottom section of the income distribution doing the essential work for which everybody clapped of uh, running the public and private services of the city. Now, if things are really going to be different in the future from the past in those terms, then I put it to you that this site is just the sort of place we should be holding on to and using as an experimental site for trying out the kinds of community plans, the kind of new new ideas for urbanization, which people here in the meeting have been talking about. And I'd add just one other thing to that, which is that we're not just thinking about uh, office work and housing, we're thinking about office work in the city of London, which is a global financial center. And we're doing so a month before the end of the Brexit transition period. And as well as the other crises that people have already referred to, we have got Brexit about to hit us. And it is not clear how much more of the financial sector we are going to lose from central London. It might be really quite a lot. Certainly the owners of, uh, of central London real estate are very anxious about it. And I think it remains to be seen what part of the, of the banking financial services sector remains. And it's therefore an extremely odd time to be going ahead with something which is substantially a large scale office development. That's one aspect of the future which we need to keep open and experiment about, not, make, not commit enormous decisions to. Secondly, on the housing side, it's very clear that the, the impact of COVID on the housing system seems to be already that people who could afford it are thinking of moving further out. Suburbs are moving out of London altogether. Where they can better work at home, gardens and open spaces. And that the days of the little tiny central London apartment may be numbered. Now, for all those reasons, I think it would be extremely wise of the Mayor of London to just say. This is an out of date kind of plan, which various people have said already this afternoon. It's an out of date kind of plan. Let's stop this. Let's use it as an opportunity to mobilize local people, community opinion, scientists, and so on, to really think about the future in a new way. And here's a wonderful site on which it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, um, let's just point out that anyone that's not that, that, that's not spotted it, um, that Francis has put various links in the in the in the group chat, um, particularly on the Latin Village, Liverpool Land Commission, Public Commons Partnerships, um, GLA Good Growth by Design, Adaptive Strategies, and so on. So there's lots there's lots here that we can that, that we can draw on because there's some, a sort of something quite surreal about seeing. The sort of debate that's been happening about cities for the last few years and then seeing this thing still being proposed it's sort of undead <laughs> kind of vampiric quality to the whole to the whole thing um so uh does, does anyone else want to come in on any of this uh, i'd like to say a couple of things please do if i can uh just uh, i'll just, just a quick little list here uh, ownership was mentioned so i just want to clarify um, 100% that the entire site here is in public ownership. It's owned by Network Rail. Um, the developers, Hammers and Ballymore, bought an option on it and they bought it a long time ago. I think it was 2002. In fact, they, it was a fire sale when, as rail, ironically, as rail track was re-nationalized because it failed, in the very last week of private ownership, they flogged off everything they had left in a fire sale to Hammersons. 64 million bought them pockets of land all over the country. And within that, buried within that, was an option agreement uh, on the goods yard. But that is an option that 
uh, it's a commercially sensitive arrangement. No one's been able to see the contract, even though this is public land. As I understand it, um, the option is conditional on winning planning permission. Um, we have no idea how that plays out in financial terms, although I've got rough figures in my head, which are that they, my, my approximate figures, which could be completely wrong, are that they paid six million for the option. The land without planning permission is valued at about 10 times that. With planning permission, it's another 10 times that. Um, so <laughs> the, the multipliers for them are very good. Um, so that, that's just the ownership thing. Um, then someone I, I saw, I think, came up in the chat somewhere. Someone was asking about uh, examples. Uh, do we have any examples of successful schemes in the past? And there's one that springs to mind to me, which is the Coin Street development yeah. um, in Lambeth, because that was a, a, a community-led campaign for a long time. I, mean, I think they campaigned for this over seven, eight, nine years. Uh, completely unrealistic, pie-in-the-sky stuff to do with the community determining their future. Um, the, the site, this is the site along Waterloo, um, uh, roughly to the east of the South Bank. Um, so the, the site was you know, the usual thing. Some developers wanted to get hold of it to build big, big boxes. Uh, the community said no. There was, there was enough of a residential community there to, to want to take control of their destiny. Um, they managed to persuade the GLC. I think part, either partly or wholly, the land was owned by the GLC. Yeah. Um, and I think that the deal was going to be, they, they were going to sell it to private developers for I think 4 million, but at some point the GLC decided to actually think in favor of the local community. And even the fact of them thinking that way deval devalued the land, interestingly, um, to the point where eventually the community, uh, I think it's Coin Street um, Co-op or something like that, was mm -hmm. able to buy the land from the GLC for a quarter of the commercial price. And I think we, should be able to say, I haven't got a huge insight into the nuts and bolts of it, but it looks to me like a successful win-win type of situation between local community. It's not an uncommercial development. And it's a very successful thing. Uh, you know, it's a huge tourist draw now, the walk way along the Thames, the community still has control of their destiny. I'm an outsider. I don't know the details. I'm sure there's controversies there, um, but I have to say, uh, I, I thought too late that, it, um, it, about a year ago, I talked to Ian Tuckett, who's been involved with Coin Street since it was a campaign thing, and it would have been interesting to have him in a discussion like this to hear of that experience. Uh, right, two more things very quickly. Um, uh, someone asked about whether we could um, focus on look at the hotel Airbnb issue. Um, that, that's been a bone of contention. Tower Hamlets Council has objected to the scheme uh, partly because of the presence of the hotel. Um, the hotel needs assessment for London is 57,000 new hotel rooms needed between now and um, 2042. Sounds like a lot, but that's 8,000 over towns and Hackney. And they pretty much built those already. There are 1,200 hotel rooms being built or in existence on one road, Great Eastern Street. So hotel things nonsense, but, but coupled with that, Airbnb is very worrying. Um, the, the, this bit of East London is, is an Airbnb hotspot. Um, and the housing above the hotel, one bedroom expensive flats will just become ghost town or Airbnb. Um, and then I think quickly two more things. One is uh, uh, we just heard mentioned the idea of an opportunity to experiment. And I think that's really important. I think that's where I would hope that politicians could see some excitement coming out of thinking differently here. Um, and, and the last thing practical is how on earth can we translate this discussion into having some kind of influence on Sadiq Khan's decision on Thursday. Yeah, that's a really crucial one, because that's the, that's the real difference between something like this and something like Coin Street, is that they bent the ear of the GLC in the era when, you know, its finance department was run by John McDonnell. Um, so there was much more possibility for them to be able to kind of go, you know, we want to do this. And they were able to come in and um, with them. But I think one of the things is that the ideas behind that have been very unfashionable for a very long time. But in recent years, they have become much more of a thing that people talk about, like particularly the kind of ideas of community wealth building that a lot of councils, Newham in particular, kind of talk about quite a lot nowadays. Um, that they're very, very similar ideas to the sort of GLC idea of a people's plan. And, you know, we, that, that you find out what people in a particular area do and you plan on the basis of that. Um, so they're really kind of, it's very much an idea that 
seems to have come back again. So I don't, it's, I think a lot of it is really just kind of how do you convince the GLC's successor of this? And I've had very little experience in trying to convince them of things. Um, but um, does anyone else have anything they want to come in on? Because I think we should probably- yeah. to Could I, Owen, could I, could I just briefly come in on the community wealth building question? Yeah. Um, and also what you were saying about how uh, public authorities aren't talking to each other about public goods, you know, public value. Um, I, there's, there's something really practical here where it feels like people are just kind of locked into a situation that they don't quite know how to get out of. It's kind of like Adam was saying about the developer. Even the developer probably is thinking, God, how have we got ourselves involved in such a ridiculous kind of situation? How do we get back out of that? And there's a really key thing, I think, that elected um, politicians and councils can do. And I think that's where the community wealth building stuff is so interesting that since Phil Glanville's been mayor of Hackney, they've really repurposed their thinking around kind of just making a real statement about the fact that they are there for the people of Hackney to support those who need who need them. That's what they're elected to do. That's what their resources are for. And so in some ways, it's, it's kind of getting local authorities to kind of see, to be brave enough to take that role and see that they, they can do that without compromising relationships with developers. You know, that of course there are always gonna be developers working across London, that's fine. But there are those pockets where they can really make a difference. And so it's the conversation we've been having with Haringey about, um, you know, the Granger development with Latin Village is, you know, they just can't, um, they just won't quite go that extra mile to sort of say, yes, we could be the people who said to Granger, actually, we're not going to, you know, kind of impose the CPO because they're so worried about the developer suing them, but they, they haven't discovered actually what that would mean, how much, you know, that would cost or anything. And so th there's a bravery element to this. I think there's a sort of, there's a, a real, you know, vision and a, a bravery to this that we need people to step up and, and do. May I make a point? Please. May I ask, um, is that all right? Were you going to reply, Owen? No, 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 not at all. Because um, I ask um, Joe Giddings from the Architects uh, Environmental Group what um, you, what, what the sort of architects, what, um, well, can you explain quickly what it is, but I'm wondering whether the feelings of David Chipperfield, which are that architects ought to really grab this, grab these ideas and be um, quite strong. Do you think those are those are the architects want to, you know, be bold and uh, in a particularly broker think the some of these difficult things that are going on. As, as opposed to just, um, you know, being the, the sort of servants in a way. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah, so my name's Joe. I'm from the Architects Climate Action Network. Um, I think that's a, yeah, that's a difficult question. I think most architects do want to be bold and to, and to really do things in a different way. But I, I suppose a lot of the time architects' hands are tied by, um, the regulatory framework that we we work within um, but yeah I think it's important to note uh, as many times as we can that we are in a climate emergency and it was good to hear Philip talking about that earlier and to link that into um, the conversation that was happening just now I, I think this is a tool that local communities can use um, to make the argument that um, development should be always responding to the fact that we're in a climate emergency. And I think um, what that means for this is that um, we know that a couple of years ago, the UN set out exactly how much carbon we could emit in total if we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. They then looked at how this spread out over the next 30 years and, and said that we have to halve our emissions globally by 2030. And, and that was two years ago and emissions have only gone up since then. So we have even less time. And how that relates to this scheme is that if approved, this will be built within the years between now and 2030. And it's really important that the emissions during these years are 
brought down dramatically. And looking at this scheme and looking at the planning application, it's clear that the developer hasn't set out how they'll do that. And that's because it's really just not their priority, <laughs> I think. Um, so I think, I think the mayor really has a responsibility here. Um, the architects do have some agency, but, but really now the mayor has a responsibility to, to demand that these schemes that are referred to him set out exactly how they'll reduce these embodied carbon emissions. And um, important to end on the point, I'm not saying that simply all development should be stopped, full stop, but I think Philip put it really beautifully earlier, the most sustainable thing that we can do now this week is to just take more time. <laughs> um, and then to focus then on the benefits that using low carbon materials will bring. And that, that's what I think communities have to learn how to do. Um, they need to focus on those benefits. It's more sustainable to retain the existing urban fabric. Uh, and that fact can be used by communities that are fighting demolition of housing estates and communities that want local heritage to be saved. You know, we need to be saving existing buildings. That's almost the money, most sustainable thing that we can do. And um, yeah, so I, I think I'll end on that. Thanks, thank you. Um, so does anyone else have anything, anything they want to come in on? Because I think we've gone, we've gone quite over time. <laughs> Um, sorry, may, may I ask uh, Rupon, talking of um, talking of historic buildings, Rupon, would you just like to tell us quickly about the Boundary Estate where you grew up? Because um, that is a historic building, but it also is very functional. Oh, certainly. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rupon. Uh, I'm from the Boundary Estate. And, uh, you know, I've, grew, I've literally grew up here, to be honest. And what, what, what it is, is, is the character uh, it's got. It's like it's a community, uh, community area, to be honest. And uh, since I've been growing up, we've, we've always had uh, stuff that was there for the community to play around with. We had little, like, you know, little uh, greenery parts where we could play football. Uh, we had courtyards where, you know, you, you've got games, uh, you know, little uh play areas you know we've we've as as an asian community should i say we've always had uh asian games where you know you play with balls different types of balls uh, uh different elements to be honest with different type of games in the courtyards and there were certain things around the boundary estate where you could you know as as a community you could go out and do things uh where i i to be honest would really like if they were doing this scheme or this thing, uh, what well, the buildings, to be honest, more involved in community activities. And, you know, it will benefit the Boundary Estate as well as uh, the surrounding areas. And, you know, it's always been, the East End has always been about the community vibe. And it still is, should I say. And, you know, it'd be, it, it, to, to, to be honest, looking at the whole uh, structure of uh, the housing and stuff, you can see that it is kind of like segregated from the community and it will be sad uh, not, you know, not being able to kind of uh, be part of the community. And, you know, it'd be nice if they actually integrated a bit more of the community aspect to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've grown up here, I'm still living here and uh, it would be nice uh, with certain, th uh, certain things, uh, certain thoughts. Uh, Put up, put in, should I say, into this uh, development? But uh, well, you know, uh, if uh, the whole character of the boundary is is marvelous. I mean, I mean, uh, obviously, if guys come around here or if, uh, people who's already here living here know exactly how the boundary estate is. Uh, one one thing we found was that in this development, all the children's play areas are on top of roofs so they're going to be losing a lot of balls in the street presumably that's that's a bit sad <laughs> that's a bit sad uh over to you who are we going over to sorry i only got the you, 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 i think we'll all
Yeah. Well, I think if anyone just if we have put it so one more time to see if anyone else has anything they want to come in on, and then we can wrap up. You have to unmute. Can I add two comments? Please do. It's been a really impressive event the last hour and a half. And I put it together in my mind with two other events. One is that when I was involved for 20 years in the struggles about King's Cross and what would happen there, we had some extraordinarily productive sessions, a bit like this, but without the electronics, face to face in, in buildings, in which the combined capacities of existing residents, existing businesses, some sympathetic researchers and architects and others were able to be extremely productive in thinking about alternatives and challenging the official orthodoxy and helped to contribute to what finally happened on that site. The second is something which Lucy and I were both involved in, which was the endless discussions which led up to the community-led plan for London, which the Just Space Network produced, which mobilized hundreds of people in groups all over London, having workshops about different aspects of London planning. And I think the potentialities of this sort of discourse in these kind of conditions sustained over weeks and months can just be incredibly productive. So I congratulate you on having got this one together and urge the Mayor of London to uh, foster and irrigate this kind of discussion and really mobilize it and make it a distinctive London phenomenon which he can tell the world about. Well, I think that the, thank you, Michael. Um, I think what we need to remember is that just in three days time, on Thursday at 2 p.m., the mayor will be making his a decision, apparently, in, in this hearing. So for, uh, six of us get four minutes each to speak on. We, we've got to sort of tailor our, our speech very carefully. And Saif, do you want to say anything? You're going to be coming with and talking about Brick Lane. Are you there? <laughs> um, I'm here. Can everyone... Can you hear me? Yeah, um, yeah um, I'm actually kind of um, quite excited about this idea of an alternative plan. I think the um, the site's really unusual in that um, it's kind of also been quite organically kind of starting to grow and become something quite different, which I don't think the new plans kind of take on board. Um, uh, and I think that that possibility is actually very, very exciting. But then I have just become a student, so um, anything um excites me at the moment um the other thing is um i'm mainly kind of talking about the impact on the local community and um especially the bangladeshi community because my parents are bangladeshi and i was brought up locally as well and the site's very 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 important um locally. so yeah really excited hopefully says no and gives the site over to us hi hi everyone do you mind if i just Jump in, Lucy. No, no, do. Right, uh, I, I haven't met most of you, but I'm Gary, and I'm I'm supposed to be speaking on um, on on Thursday. So if I do, I just wanted to say it's been really interesting um, listening to you all tonight, and I've I've learned a lot, and um, and I really hope that um, yeah, I can I can get as many of your your points or or at least your your sort of passions for for what you're talking about forward and I'll, I'll do my best on on your behalf to try and sort of uh, convey what, what I've learned from you guys tonight so th thanks a lot. Thanks you're welcome. So Lucy is there anything you want to kind of sum up on? Oh well I want to thank everybody for for joining in it was really really great and what we we we, we hoped to just bring bring the voices together and really that just have a com combined uh, think about this mm -hmm. and really we'd love to go forward and try and do all alternatives and just take off take some of the energy that's that's been contributed and um we are going to produce a, a sort of document by writing down quickly tonight some of the things that have been said and give that to Sadiq. 
And I think that there's some of the things that have been said are very, you know, profound about the future and why we need to think about this decision. He needs to th think about this decision very, very carefully. Thank you. Well, thanks for thanks for asking me to to, to share this as well. It's been really encouraging to see this happening. I think just because so many things like this have been sort of forced through for so long that it's there was always a point where it has to stop eventually, and I think this is kind of very much a good a good place for that to for that to happen. So so fingers crossed and good luck on Thursday. Thank you. Do we say goodbye? All right. Thanks all. <laughs> all right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. This Thank recording you. is there on YouTube for people who missed it live. Yeah. Yes. And thank you to David Chipperfield for um, contributing uh, with his letter and uh, doing such a good job of, you know, keeping the goods yard uh, on in people's minds, I think. Right. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Owen.